Hello and welcome to our conversation with Marwa Zamir and Rehan Ali on World Refugee Day. I'm Rita Sakr, Assistant Professor in Postcolonial and Global Literatures in the Department of English at Maynooth University. I apologize from the start if my voice is weak or I cough as I'm recovering from illness. I am very pleased to be co-hosting this webinar with Andrew Clark, who is completing a PhD in the English department on the work of Teju Cole. Andrew and I would like to thank Dr. Gemma Irvine, Vice President for Equality and Diversity at MU for supporting this event. And we are also grateful for the support of our head of department, Professor Lauren Arrington, and our colleague, Stephanie McClelland, who is handling all digital aspects. This event is in collaboration with MU Sanctuary Committee and the Irish Network for Middle Eastern and North African Studies. This year, the focus of World Refugee Day is that every person on this planet has a right to seek safety, whoever they are, wherever they come from, and whenever they are forced to flee. The right to safety, in UNHCR's words, is non-negotiable and universal. In Ireland, from where I am speaking, the question of unconditional welcome and meaningful sanctuary for those who are forced to flee their homes due to war, persecution, human rights abuses, and environmental catastrophe has never been more important than at this moment, when 100 million people are forcibly displaced worldwide, 40% of whom are children and when we are all awaiting the end of the direct provision system as promised by the Irish government. To start, I'm inspired by the words of the wonderful Sandrine Dahiro, co-founder of Unsilencing Black Lives and Unapologetic magazine, and her contribution to a recently released book, The Liminal, Notes on Life, Race and Direct Provision in Ireland. Sandrine writes, we need to protect those that are the most vulnerable members in our society by actively listening to their daily struggles of life and their provision and actively find ways to make sure that we amplify those voices. To honor refugees on this very important day is also to insist that the legacy of direct provision should not be forgotten and that this should be told on their own terms by those who have lived through this system. And most importantly, that their stories of courage, inspiring resilience and hopeful creativity resound. We are celebrating today the creative achievements of Merwa and Rehan, and also their collaborations with brilliant individuals, organizations and communities that have been working with and for all those who seek refuge in Ireland. Thank you very much, Rita, and uh, thank you to everyone for joining us for an online event on such a beautiful sunny day. We appreciate it a lot. Um, to introduce our wonderful panelists today first, um, Marwa Zamir is from Kabul in Afghanistan. She came to Ireland in 2016 with her family and spent three years in direct provision. She received her refugee status in 2019 and is planning to study law starting in 2022. Marwa is passionate about using her voice to help others and to advocate for improvements for people who are seeking protection in Ireland. Marwa was nominated for a Mayo Garda Youth Award in 2019 for her community work with Boroga. She contributed a part of her story to Correspondences, an anthology to call for an end to direct provision. She, uh, published in 2019. She's been invited to read her work at various events, including a meeting with President Michael B. Higgins, and she gave an interview on the RT Arena radio show. She's a volunteer with Taroga Youth Club, a youth leader with the Irish Refugee Council Youth Project, and currently undertaking the Silver Award, Gashka, uh, the Presidential Award. Marwa was recently appointed to the UNHCR Refugee Advisory Board. The board's aim is to ensure that the voices of refugees are heard in policy decisions that affect them. In doing so, we'll discuss issues that affect their communities and propose solutions to them. Marwa has also worked with the Zamir Foundation, an Afghan NGO working to fight food poverty in Afghanistan. Uh, we'll be speaking to Marwa first, uh, followed by Rehan. Uh, Rehan Ali 
graduated with a BSc in neuroscience and is currently studying for his MSc in bioinformatics and computational biology at University College Cork. After arriving in Ireland from Pakistan in 2005, he spent his childhood in a direct provision centre called Bridgewater House in Carrick and Shore, County Tipperary. Living under direct provision for 10 and a half years, he developed a deep fascination with storytelling and film. During this time, he joined the Tudor Artisan Hub, an independent dynamic arts collective based in Carrick and Shore that allowed him to write, direct and edit his own student films. In 2015, Rehan, along with the Tudor Artisan Hub, founded a community-based amateur film production company, Studio 42. From 2015 to 2019, Studio 42 produced six short films, largely funded by Culture Night, the Department of Culture, Heritage and Bailta, and Creative Ireland Programme in association with Tipperary County Council. His work is published in Correspondences and The Stinging Fly magazine, for which he was awarded the Narrative of Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Award by UCC. Rehan most recently won the Virgin Media Discover short film competition for a script, Water Under the Bridge, that he went on to direct for Virgin Media Television and Virgin Media On Demand, premiering at the 2022 Dublin International Film Festival. We welcome you both. Okay, well, Marwa, um, I'll, I'll begin with you, and I've, I've read through two extremely impressive um, biographies for you both. Um, could you tell us, Marwa, a little more about your work with the Forolga Youth Project uh, and the Irish Refugee Council? So, hi everyone. Um, with the Forolga, since I moved to Direct Provision, I was a member as well. So, when I left Direct Provision, I was like, and I was 18, so I could be a volunteer there. So, even though I lived in Dublin, but the Forolga voluntary thing was in Ballyhon is all the way to in Mayo but I still did it online and I'm still doing it but not that much because of my leaving cert there is the members are mostly kids from direct provision and they're doing different activities such as art workshops uh, speaking work uh, speaking word workshops different activities and with the U Irish um, Refugee Council it's basically different programs that they have for youth in direct provision and uh, so it's basically a fun activity for the pe for the youth people in direct provision that are new in the country and they need more friends they need to connect with the irish society to, with the irish society so those programs help these young people to integrate with um other people and um find more friends Brilliant, thank you. Um, you've also I mentioned in, in your biography, you're, you've been working with more recently the UNHCR Refugee Board. So yeah. what, what, what does that work entail exactly? And what, what influence do you hope that you can have through it? So this board was established to help refugees. Um, so basically, at the moment, we're working with the three problems that refugees are facing. First one is housing. Um, second one is education. Um, as you know, most refugees that come in the country, they don't spend three years to get the SUSE grant. So now they're helping with this three year um, law thing that they want to remove that so that refugees can easily get access to SUSE grant and go uh, pursue their education. And the third one is um, visa. Uh, some refugees here, especially young people, don't have their family. And when they apply for visa for their family back home, it's a very hard process. So they're making um, that process kind of easier for them and more accessible so they can have access and get that visa easily for their family. Um, and my influence, since I'm the youngest in the board and they are all with the experience, they're all worked in different organization. And um, I, when I started, they used to make fun of me, call me the young one because I was the youngest. And they're all like over their 40, 40s or 50s. But um, I always bring um, young people issues in the board because I've been through it. And I know um, as a young person, um, the direct provision experience and so I mostly bring the young people issue in the board and try to um, give them an idea as a young person what is going on in the direct provision and these are the main issues that they have to focus at the moment. 
And what would be an example, perhaps, of something we don't think about? Or one of these these young people issues that you, you mentioned, something something that they need to know more about. For example, this visa thing that they're very young, uh, most of them are under 18 and they are living alone in the direct provision centers and especially in Dublin. And it's a huge camp called Balsiskin. And um, and also for them, they get their papers quickly, but for their families to come over, it takes ages. And mostly they cannot like apply for, they can only apply for parents they cannot even apply for their siblings. It's a long process and a very difficult process. And um, they have to get solicitors and because the paperwork is very hard. So that's what I bring to the board. And also the Susie Grant, the two, three years, because lots of my friends in direct provision haven't stayed here for three years. And so they cannot get the SUSE grant because they cannot afford um, universities courses. So that's why um, I was like, this is the main focus. We have to work on this. So I, um, I spoke, um, I um, told the, um, the members of the board that this issue is the important one when we have to work on it. And now um, four members are working on that issue. Yes. And the housing as well. Because they are not working and don't have good income, um, it's hard for them to find houses. So they get HAP. Um, house owners don't really accept HAP they, um, when they hear it, even though it's illegal to say no to the HAP, but they still do. So this is the third issue that young people are, even all the direct provision people are facing at the moment, but especially young people because they have they don't have good income. Thank yeah. you. Um, speaking of university, and you, you were mentioning Susie, um, you've been kind enough to take time out before your final leaving cert exam to tomorrow, if, if I'm correct. Yeah. Um, so we appreciate you very much doing that. And you're hoping to study law from next year. Um, yeah. Can you tell me how your experiences as an asylum seeker and then a refugee in Ireland have influenced your, your, your choice to pursue a career in law? What, what, how do you think they might inform that particular career path that you, you hope to go down? Yeah, so I picked, like, if you see my CU application, the 10 option, it's all like law, law, law with different universities. So it's, it's only law. Um, I think um, before direct provision, I was, uh, I mean, in Kabul, I always wanted to have a good career and do my education, everything, but um, when and then my dad was working in UN back home so I was always like growing up seeing him I was like I want to work in a charity organization help people build the school and everything but then when I moved to Ireland direct provision really helped me gain confidence and uh, I mean opened my eyes to see everyone and then us having a solicitor with our case and story and everything uh, taught me oh, how it's important like a solicitor a lawyer uh, job and role and how they influence uh, people in direct provision. So um, that's when I decided I want to do law and because that's the pathway I think I can pursue and um, can help me um, help other people in direct provision. That's why I decided to do law. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think Rita will have some questions now for what I have. Thanks, Marla. Hi, Rehan. Um, it's good to see you and talk to you again. Um, in your piece in the anthology correspondences, that piece is titled What's in a Name, uh, you describe um, a moment where you are trying to look out of a window in the accommodation center and you say, but this is a good place to fall. What do I choose? At the end of the road, when there's no more hope, I choose me. I choose us. I am young, so let us fall and let us restart. Images of the road and the bridge appear across your work and you have spoken of the struggle to arrive. Um, how has filmmaking supported your journey on a more hopeful path? Yes, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure and, and a delight to be here. Um, on a, such a special day for such a special event. So it's such a privilege to be here. But talking about, you know, the bridge and the road, and yes, those, um, I see them as monuments and they, they play such a huge part in a lot of what I do, in a lot of my work. And the reason why is 
for me, you know, the idea of a road um, is what it is for most people. It's, it's a journey. And it feels like for me and for most people who are like me, you know, you're on this ongoing journey um, that is filled with struggle. And it's, it's filled with so many obstacles. And you're kind of looking out for that bridge to be able to overcome those obstacles. And that's what I've always felt. And it's just happened to, to by coincidence, the hostel I grew up with in was called Bridgewater House. Uh, I grew up in a small town uh, called Carrick on Shore that had two bridges. So these, these monuments have played such a significant part in my entire life um, by just by chance, but they developed such a, a powerful meaning to me without me even fully realizing until I actually look back at my own work and realize, wow, they do play a, play a significant part. I didn't purposely do it, but it just seemed to happen. Um, and now I can't seem to move away from it. Every time I do something, every time I make uh, a piece of uh, writing or a piece of art, I always realize, oh, wow. You know, it just, it, it somehow uh, just seeps into my work, no matter what, I, what I'm doing, it just comes in, which makes sense as an artist, because as an artist, you take from your real life experiences. And for me, that's so important. Uh, and so it's inevitable that what I've experienced is going to seep into my work. And I, I think that is why um, I have been fortunate enough to, to have my work be accepted by so many people is because they see the authenticity in it. But talking about film and writing and how that's helped me, I don't know how I would have gotten through the childhood that I had, had it not been for my ability to escape into a different world, a different realm. And the only way I could really do that was through pen and paper and being able to create worlds for myself, a, a world that made more sense, a world that was more just, more equal, um, a world that I didn't see in reality, unfortunately. But I, I you know, looking out the window, I, I could imagine a world that was better, that was more equal, a world that where you could bridge those, those gaps of inequality. And so writing really just helped me, helped me go into this, this fantasy world that shouldn't be a fantasy, it should be the real world, but unfortunately isn't. And so uh, when I do write and when I do uh, you know, write scripts for film, I always try and make them authentic and you know, express real world scenarios and experiences. Because uh, I feel like, you know, again, growing up, I didn't see enough of it. I definitely didn't see enough of uh, my own experiences. So whenever I do write, I, I make sure to um, invoke so much of what I've gone through. Um, so yeah, without film I, and writing, I don't know how I could have gone through it. So it's definitely, it's definitely been, been the thing that saved me, but it's also it, it, just a, t thinking about it in a different way. Um, my own experiences living in, in Bridgewater House and growing up in a direct provision system has, has shaped who I am as a writer. And it, without it, I don't think I would be as open-minded or I would embrace so many of the issues that my ex, uh, work explores had it not been for the fact I grew up in such a community where we all kind of had, we all had different struggles and different journeys, but we were in a place in time where we were together and we were suffering through something together. And the sense of community where People are from all different parts of the world, but we come together and we are going through something that is, um, you know, that is equal among us. Uh, the inequality is equal among us, weirdly enough. Um, it just, it really did shape me as a writer. Um, so it's the silver lining that I see uh, from my experience is the fact that had it not been for that, I don't think I would be the artist or the writer that I am. So it's the one thing that I, I feel honored about is that I got to share such an unjust journey with people who have been remarkable and who have shaped who I am. So for that, I will be forever grateful. I love hearing from you the hope, but also the sense yeah, to get togetherness in all sorts of ways is so important in the struggle against inequality. And there's there are so many aspects of togetherness in your work, including being parts of arts collectives. Um, I'd love to hear from you uh, about um, your work uh, with uh, the Artisan Tutor Hub, with Studio 42 and more. Absolutely. Something that we don't talk enough about is a sense of community and how important that is for people who you know, feel like they have been excluded. And that is the truth 
about people in direct provision, they have been excluded. And so I grew up in Carrick on Shore. It's a small Irish town. Um, and all of a sudden, you know, in the early 2000s, Bridgewater House kind of came to be. Um, and suddenly in the small Irish town, you have this huge influx of diversity and people from all over the world. So I was one of those people. And I am so grateful that if I was going to grow up in a direct provision system, which no child should have to, but I'm grateful that I grew up in that town because as soon as you walked out the doors of the unjust uh, hostel accommodation center, um, you had a community that really embraced you or that has been my experience. And working with the Tudor Artisan Hub that was founded by Linda Fahey, who is an incredible, incredible person. Um, she has inspired me to, to keep writing and to keep making film. Because when I started, you know, I had these desires and these ambitions, but I was a realist because when you go through the, the experiences that you have, even as a child, you become a realist because you do understand the way the world works. So I had these ambitions, but I knew that at most they're probably fantasies. I have these pieces of writing, but am I ever going to be able to actually put them on film? But when I met her, she gave me the confidence uh, and honestly, the ability to finally be able to do that. She supported me in what was my main goal in life, which was to make film. And uh, because of her, I got to do that. And together we founded uh, Studio 42, which is just you know a studio uh, created by local people that employed local people. And together, we, uh, the community came together to make so many different short films, um, which was really, it's insane to look back at, that the fact that we did this. Um, you would never think about it in such a small town, but we ended up doing that. And we had so many people come in and help, and it was all voluntary because you know we can afford to pay anybody, but everyone kind of came together and we made these, these pieces of work that mean so much to me. Um, we didn't really have all the equipment that we may have needed, but we had the passion and we had the love uh, and we had that sense of community. That's the word that I always go back to is community. It's so, so important. So if anyone out there is listening right now and you are trying to figure out how you can help, say people, not only just in direct provision, but anyone that feels excluded, is to just reach out. It's to reach out and, and try and include them and try and make them feel as if they are part of something bigger, as if they are part of this community. It's such a huge help. That's the reason why I'm sitting here right now today is because people reach out to me. I wouldn't have made Water Under the Bridge which is a dream come true for me to be able to have made that film, had it not been for Linda Fahey and the Tudor Artist Snub and the people of Carrick on Shore. If they had not accepted me and pushed me and encouraged me to, to make film and to keep writing, I wouldn't be here and I wouldn't have done it. So it's so, so important that you know, people feel included, that people feel empowered to be able to follow their ambitions and dreams. Because when you grow up in direct provision or if you're just in direct provision, things can seem incredibly dreary and just it feels like you know no matter how much uh, you fight you're not going to get through it so it's so important to empower people to be able to follow through with their ambitions because they are so talented they have so much talent they have so much passion for so many different things uh, and um, unfortunately a system that is as cruel and as unjust as the direct provision system can try and dampen it down so that is why community is so important to remind them that no you can do whatever you want. You have that in you. And that's how I felt as part of the Caracan Shore community. So for, for that, I am so incredibly grateful. And they've always supported me. Water Under the Bridge, when I got this film, my main goal was I need to shoot this in Caracan Shore. And it was a struggle. I had to convince the producers. You know, they wanted to shoot in Dublin, like every film is shot in Dublin. Um, so it was such a huge hassle to go to, you know, a small town. But it was such a dream come true to finally bring a film team, a, a professional film crew, and shoot this film in the town that I grew up in. Um, and to, to have that for Carrick, I'm sure, um, you know, a town filled with such incredible people, incredibly welcoming people. So, yeah, that was such a dream come true. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that would be my main uh, uh, point, of, point here is that community is so important. It cannot be understated how important it is. For people like me, so please, please reach out. I cannot, you know, it's I cannot say that enough. Do reach out. 
Thank you, Rehan. And what you achieved is beautiful and powerful and a true triumph against injustice. Um, Andrew and I um, were very lucky to, uh, to watch your short film and you're going to show us now um, a few clips from um, the film. Yes, absolutely. So what I'm about to share now is when I wanted to share a bit of my film, it was important to share Bilal, who is the protagonist of this film. And uh, the film itself narrates the first few steps of this protagonist, of this young refugee into a new world, into his, uh, his new world that is Ireland. So the film itself is really, it is Bilal, and it is his, not only his uh, very overt struggle that we see you know, from the outside, but also a lot of what he struggles uh, from the inside. So this is really an introduction to Bilal, which in itself does introduce the film and hopefully will give you a little bit uh, of an idea of the both aesthetic and the atmosphere and the aim of the film. Um, so hopefully you get that across. Let me know if there's any issues. Just don't forget who you are and where you come from. That's gonna be that. Well, lucky you, Bill. We caught you at a good time. We were just uh, gonna have some fun. And you're coming with us. Well, that's where you're welcome, Party. I don't think uh -uh. We weren't asking. Please. Well, it's in town, don't you? Oh, look, there's our Scott. That's why he'll meet us there. Hey, don't you want to have fun? Make some new friends? It's only over there. Trust us, you'll love it. So why do they want you to wear it? What? The uh oh. they just think it will protect you. Hey, I, I mean I think it's good. But they're probably wondering where you are right now. My father probably is it's just him, my sister and I.
Well, there was a short glimpse into uh, Bilal as a both as a character, but also as a, as the person who moves the story of the film. He is the story of the film. Um, so I hope that came across well. I know it's difficult sharing something through through Zoom. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rayhan. And when the film is more more widely available, I would urge everyone here um, to, to to see it in full. It's, it's a beautiful piece of work, and you've really you managed to refer and allude to so many aspects, uh, uh, surprising aspects, perhaps for many of, of the um, the direct provision experience. And um, we might talk about that a little little later, perhaps with time. Um, but. Could you just tell us first, how did the film come about? Um, it's, it's a difficult process to get a film made. And, and from that, I guess, who, who's your ideal audience for it? And, and has it reached them yet or, or will it reach them? Yeah, well, uh, how the film came about is definitely, uh, it's somewhat interesting. So I was in my final year of neuroscience. So, so that was stressful enough, but you know, I saw this opportunity to be able to uh, essentially write a, a, a pitch. And so I did for this script and I submitted it in for the Virgin Media Discoveries competition. Um, and so it was during one of my um, end of semester one exams uh, that I got a call. So these exams were happening online. So I got a call um, and it was from Virgin Media and they had said that I had been um, shortlisted. So that was def it was a difficult uh, it was a very difficult exam to finish. So I definitely felt like I should celebrate. Uh, so that in itself was pretty mind blowing because I had submitted it, didn't realize, you know, I didn't expect that you know I would, you know, even be shortlisted because it's such a, a prestigious competition with so many people trying to get in. So when I got the call, that was very exciting. Um, and so you know things really started to go on from there. I was, I was trying to manage studies. Uh, so I was doing all my neuroscience studies in the in the morning, and in the evening I was working on building the script. So once you get get um, shortlisted, you then have to work on your script uh, and get it ready to pitch uh, in in hopes that you become one of the final winners. So uh, I worked on the script and I worked alongside Lee Magaday, who's an incredible film producer. Uh, she's produced films like The Lobster and Favorite, uh, and so she was fantastic. So I was having meetings with her, and she was helping me. Uh, you know, she, she never overstepped, which was a beautiful thing. You know, she guided me and, and you know, imparted so much wisdom because she knows the film industry and she knows films and she knows how to write. She, she doesn't call herself a writer, but she, she might as well be because she's so fantastic. So she really guided me through the entire process. And so I had this final script ready to go um, to, to be able to pitch. So on the day of the pitch, um, you know, I finished up all my neuroscience study in the morning and by the time the evening came, it, it, it came to my time to pitch. So I had to pitch the film, this film to people like Lenny Abramson and Lisa McGee, who created Dairy Girls. Um, so, you know, it was so intimidating uh, to be sitting there and having those people, you know, it was, again, it was over Zoom. And for some reason, I feel like it made it even, even more intimidating for me. So I, I was sitting there looking at these incredible people that I look up to, and they had already read the script. But I had, to, I had to really pitch it. We had a couple of minutes to pitch it. So I did. And um, it was one of those things where you don't know how you did. You know, it feels like it just went by really quick. You have no idea whether they liked it or not. I know Lisa McGee had, a, a, you know, she had really nice words to say about my script. So that gave me a little bit of confidence. But I just, I really didn't know how I did. So later on, it was on the Virgin Media box office show that they were, uh, it was during the shoot of that show they had called me, uh, I'd set up my webcam. So, you know, I was on the show and they were revealing who had finally won the competition. And uh, I was so ecstatic to hear my name and my script, Water Under the Bridge, being called as one of the winners. So when, when that happened, I was just over the moon. Um, and so finally, you know, was, we were ready to go and we had the budget and we had Virgin Media supporting us to make this short film. Um, so that's how it really all came about. And then I had my mentor, Frank Berry, who just uh, directed a full feature, uh, Aisha, which is also about drug provision. And he's an incredible filmmaker that, I, again, someone I really looked up to. So he was mentoring me through the actual filming of, of this film, the shooting of this film, uh, the pre-production, the post-production. He was with me throughout it. So he has been such a huge inspiration and a mentor and, and, and also a friend that uh, I'm so grateful for. 
Uh, so, so yeah, shooting this film was, it was stru a struggle. We constantly had to change dates because of COVID. We had to you know, follow all the protocols because it was still very much a significant threat when you're shooting the film. If one person kind of gets COVID, you kind of have to stop everything. Um, you know, you don't have the budget to be able to stall stuff once you get started. So that was a huge struggle, but we got through it. Um, and my main goal, my main goal, not only was to shoot in Caricature, but I wanted the lead, the protagonist, Bilal, to be someone who reflected the story uh, and the world of the story. And so I was so, when we were holding auditions, I was just so blown away to see Peter Obiderin, who plays Bilal, audition. So we were holding Zoom auditions and he appeared. I knew Peter. He was a childhood friend of mine and we grew up together in Caricature. Uh, we were the only two people of color uh, in our class uh, for a good while. And so when I saw him you know, audition, I was just blown away to see him because I never thought he would want to audition for something like this. He was always quite reserved. Um, so when he did, I was just in, in shock. But I knew straight away that this was the way to go. He's never acted before. This was his first time acting. All the other young people who are fantastic, uh, you know, they they know how to act. They've they studied acting and they're, they're amazing in it. Uh, Peter was uh, was the first time, and it was a lot of people saw it as a risk. But for me, there was no other way to go about it because this is what I wanted to go do from the start. So he knows those experiences like I know. So he is someone who truly, you know, embodies this film uh, as an individual. Um, and so it's such a privilege to be able to share my first time making like a real, real short film with with another person that I consider a great friend uh, to also have his first time act in it. So it was it was insane to sit at the Dublin International Film Festival and see his face on the big screen. This 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 kid that I grew up with that I was re I was friends with, um, and together we came together years later. I went back to the small town and we came together and we made this film together. And then we were both sitting there watching him and watching my script on the big screen you know, with a sold out audience at the Dublin International Film Festival. It was, it was a surreal experience, something I'm never going to forget. So yeah, that's how, that's how the film came about. <laughs> so, and talking about the audience, I think the right audience for this is everybody. Uh, you know, there isn't a specific, it's everybody. Where even people who've gone through direct provision, who know what it's like, I know how important it is to see yourself being reflected in something, in a film, in anything, to see your experiences uh, or seeing someone like you being reflected. So, you know, it's a film for them. It's a film for people like me. It, it's for people who don't know what direct provision even is. When I was writing the script, I met so many people, so many of my contemporaries, so many of my peers, uh, people you know that were doing neuroscience with me, my classmates who didn't even know what direct provision was. So you know, it's a film for them. It's a, a film for people who know what direct provision is but don't care much about it. You know, it doesn't affect them. And unfortunately, there's a significant amount of people who are like that. If something doesn't affect them, they don't seem to care. Um, it's a film for them. It's a film for everybody. Everybody should see films like this that tell real life experiences and tell tales of injustice, not injustice that has that have gone by, but we are very much still in the middle of. So there is something that we can do to stop it. And yet, as a society, it seems that we refuse to do. And until we really start expressing and exposing what these injustices are, I don't know if we ever can overcome them. That is why this film and movies like this and films like this, you know, I think they're for everybody. Everybody should see them. Um, and I think definitely to have it on television, which was another um, just a dream come true to be able to make something and then it was broadcast on television. I definitely think it reached uh, a good amount of people, uh, the right people, which is again, everybody. And now it's been uh, in, in a few festivals. Just recently, it was at the Fastnet Film Festival. And it was such an honor to have David Putnam screen it for a special screening. David Putnam is another person I looked up to. During my final year of neuroscience, I was also a Putnam Scholar, which is a very prestigious uh, scholarship. So I was learning about writing and filmmaking under David Putnam. And um, so to have him you know, take this film and hold a special screening and then appear on a panel with me to be able to talk about this film, to be able to talk about writing and filmmaking at the Fastnet Film Festival, 
it was it was such an honor, such a dream come true. The Fast Night Film Festival is a festival that I have been wanting to go for years. I didn't imagine that my film would be screened there, um, but yet with David Putnam. So having that, it was it was it was just such an honor. So I, I definitely think it's getting getting to the right people, thankfully. Brilliant, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, David Putnam, Lenny Abramson, uh, Lisa McGee. You've 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 got to rub shoulders with some some stellar talents already, and, and that must be really encouraging and, and inspirational for you, I imagine. Um, aside from those excellent people that I've mentioned, there who are some creative influences for you when in filmmaking and, and writing? Um, see, for me. It's more about, again, real world experiences and, and people. So there's a piece that I wrote uh, recently that I'm, I'm so honored to have, to have it be published pretty soon in Atlantic Currents, uh, which is a, a book that's coming out in the, in the States. Um, and what I write about in that is, uh, is the people who inspired me and those people are kids, uh, the kids that I grew up with. So growing up in direct provision, spending 10 and a half years in direct provision, what happens is um, you know, you're there, but people are coming and going. So as a child, you know, the heartbreak of that scenario, there's many, but one of the great, great heartbreaks is the fact that you, know, you have neighbors, you have kids your, you know, your age, and you become best friends. And living in that, in that center, you spend your entire day with them. So they not only become best friends, they literally become family. So you know you, s you spend all day with them, you share everything with them. And then one day you wake up to see them packing their bags because they're either being moved or they're being deported. And rarely, you know, thankfully, you know, perhaps they, they, they're able to live uh, as uh, citizens. They're able to leave the accommodation center and just live independently. But unfortunately, the vast majority of times from my own was was they were either being moved or being deported. Um, so not only is there the heartbreak of the fact that your best friend is no longer there, they're also going to a more precarious situation. Um, so to me, that has been my main inspiration, both in my writing and in my filmmaking. It, it, it's the children that I grew up with. And that's why I love telling stories through the perspective of young people, because that's what, I, that's what really captured me and captured my soul as a writer. You'd have, I'd ha I had best friends from um, Nigeria. I had best friends from Iran, from Iraq. I, I it's it, in a weird, weird way. I, I was in one one place for ten and a half years, and yet I felt like I was exploring the world through the people that I was with and the people I was growing up with. So they would come and go, and I would stay. So I'd have these best friends, uh, and these constant heartbreaks, uh, and then this constant effort to rebuild uh, relationships, but with new people from all over the world. So it's it's those. Um, it's really those children that have that have really inspired me creatively, uh, both my writing and my film. Um, it, it's it's what I really was exposed to as a young person, and I think things when things that you're exposed to as a young person are the things that stick with you, uh, especially as an artist. That those are those are the the things that are going to shape me. Even when I try and try and attempt to write something different, my experiences in direct provision always seem to just seep into my work somehow. I don't purposely try to avoid it because I think it's so important to share those experiences. But even if I'm just writing anything else, they just seem to seep in. Uh, but I welcome those. I really do. At this point in my life, I'm, I'm comfortable enough to be able to write about the past, even if it isn't uh, the nicest thing to revisit. It really, it, it's something great to, to be able to, to, to be able to do for, for those that I grew up with, to be able to um, tell some of the experiences that we shared together. So um, that piece is coming out, I believe, in September in, in the book called Latin Currents. So I'm, I'm really excited about that coming out and hopefully some people reading that. Uh, and maybe, maybe some, some of the kids that I grew up with, somehow I have no touch with them, so I don't even know where they are. Uh, somehow, perhaps they'll uh, get to, by some coincidence, by some, some chance, get to, to read it one day and uh, know that they were remembered and they mattered and they inspired people like me. Thank you. That's that's wonderful. Um, finally, yeah, you're you're now um, coming towards the the end of a an MSc in in bioinformatics. So I 
swerve in direction in, in, in one sense or, or perhaps not. Um, so could you tell us, uh, you know, are there ways, what's, what's next and are there ways of combining a, a career in bioinformatics with further filmmaking or writing? Yeah, it's a thing to do to try and combine, but I think it's about using knowledge that you've, you've been able to grasp through um, both of those different, um, I guess, uh, interests and using them somehow. Like with bioinformatics, a lot of coding is involved. Um, you know, a, a lot of editing is involved, mostly gene editing. So it's, it's very different from editing and film, but still somehow I feel like um, you know, growing up and editing my student films all by myself, so somehow it did help. Uh, I, I definitely understand the whole concept of it a lot better. And then talking about neuroscience, so much of what I, I've learned while studying neuroscience uh, shaped a lot of my work, especially Water Under the Bridge, and in in the uh, in the ability to not only understand trauma itself, but the impact that trauma can have years after you've you know experienced it. it it's a lingering thing um and so to be able to acknowledge that and to be able to have it even subtly have its uh impact and influence in my film uh, i think the fact that i studied neuroscience really really helped me there in terms of going forward um for me it's always been managing the both uh, um, i've always wanted to be um involved in science i love science but my main passion has always been writing and filmmaking so I'm fortunate enough that I've been able to do both and be able to do both reasonably well. Uh, and uh, the fact that I can keep both up, um, both of my interests up. So I, I don't know where I'm gonna go in the future. I don't have the exact plans, <laughs> hopefully something good, but I'm just grateful that I've been able to do this master's because it's so, it's been eye-opening as a scientist and I've learned so much. Uh, so uh, I'd love to, to you know, work in the field of bioinformatics. That's what I hope to do. But I definitely am not going to be giving up on film or writing anytime soon. Uh, I have other short films that are coming out pretty soon that I've co-written uh, um, and I'm working on other scripts. I'm working on other pieces of writing. So things uh, seem to keep uh, happening, which is very exciting uh, and very encouraging. So I'm, I'm hoping to keep that going. But uh, it's, it's difficult to balance the boat, but at the same time, it's such a privilege to be able to explore both of these worlds that are so different from each other. Um, so yeah, and to be um, embraced by both of those worlds, uh, it's it's such a it's such an honor and such a privilege. Uh, there's so much to learn on this planet, and for such a long time, it felt like I was being hindered to be able to do it. So I'm not going to give up now. I'm gonna I'm gonna try and take as much as I can get. Thank you, and and we really look forward to you know seeing the uh, your energy and your your positivity channeled into to further filmmaking, and we'll be watching your career with great interest. Thanks, and back to you, Rita. Um, thank you, Rehan and Marwa. Like Rehan, your interests are quite wide ranging and high powered, and you've also contributed a beautiful piece to Correspondences. Um, yourself and the co-editor of the anthology, um, the incomparable Jessica Trainor, spoke to participants on a migration-focused free short course I had the chance to convene last October. And there you read your important story in Kabul. I was busy playing. And you are kindly going to share it with us again today. Um, so I wrote this piece in 2019 and I'm from Kabul, so it's a childhood memory. Um, the title is in Kabul, I was busy playing. It is hard to forget them. It was an accident in Kabul. I was busy playing with my sister and my cousin outside my uncle's house when suddenly a horrible sound shocked everything. It was like when you pause a video for a few minutes, then play it back. The windows were shattered. I heard people screaming, asking for help. I heard a man yelling so loud, crying komak, which means help in Farsi. My mom came and said, run, go inside. The kids were crying. They were so scared. They were shaking. Even I was. My grandmother made lemon juice for the kids to stop them crying. 30 minutes later, mom said, let's go home before anything worse happens. So while walking back to the streets, uh, streets were full of policemen, the Afghan force army and American soldiers with big, big tanks. I saw dead bodies laying on the street. Mom said, just close your eyes, hold my hand and keep walking. Two minutes later, mom said we could open our eyes again. We saw a few people cleaning something disgusting like bl blood carps burned in their clothes and burnt iron parts. Women were trying to get closer to the scene of the 
accident, but the police were not letting them. They kept begging, please let me go there. My husband is there. They were crying out so loud that the police let them approach. I was not crying. I don't know why. I was just staring at the crowd. There was not a single taxi to be found. 20 minutes later, a taxi appeared. We took it and the taxi driver said, I'll charge you a double fare. My mom replied, just go. People did in the street and the taxi driver was thinking about his business. We arrived home and my mom started looking for my dad and her own family on the phone. Me and my siblings were sitting waiting on my, on my brother's bed, holding each other's hand and looking at our mother's face. The TV was on for four or five hours. Mom was watching the news and said, it's late now, let's sleep. No one slept that night in their room. Every one of us um, slept with mom. I was holding my mom's hand. My sister was holding my mom's feet. Everyone was attached to her. I don't know about the others, but I could not sleep. Whenever I closed my eyes, I could see the blood and the body parts still dressed in their clothes. I kept my eyes open every minute. I was calling my mom that night. I was too long and very frightened. I was counting, counting, counting every second um, in my mind. Yeah. Thank you, Marua. Um... It's always difficult to, to read or hear the story, but um, it's also important. Um, and thank you for sharing it again. Um, Rehan spoke about trauma and your work addresses this and various aspects of direct provision uh, have been widely criticized by various organizations, including the Irish Refugee Council and Masi, especially with respect to aggravating already existing trauma among the forcibly displaced. Um, your story intensely communicates trauma, um, but how has storytelling contributed to your healing from this trauma? Has it contributed? Sure, healing. I feel like I was, um, I didn't want to share it first, but then um, Natasha, um, my, uh, so my mom was um, attending an English class in the camp that we were staying and Natasha was a teacher. And she told me about this thing that, Nata um, that Jessica was doing. And she told me, Mara, the stories that you tell me, you should write it. Um, and um, I was like, okay, I'll think about it. I did, I wrote it and gave it to her. And then she was like, it's amazing. You should, you should send it to Jessica. Jessica. And then when in the launch for first time reading it, I was um, I told Jessica I'm not gonna read it in front of everyone because I was not confident enough and I was like I might cry in the middle of reading it. But then uh, Natasha was standing uh, with me in the whole um reading process. She was holding my hand, she was like, You can do it, read it. I think after reading it, it just um made me more connected to um to I think to everyone and then I think everyone should know um, nobody picks um, to be a refugee. I think they're all forced to be and um, leave their house and everything. But um, also it made me kind of open and and not more confident, I'm, I think. And now I'm reading it without any problem or like getting emotional or anything. But I think um, loads of people in direct provision went through tra uh, trauma. And there's different people. I think loads of young people are not really confident to share that trauma. For me, writing this piece was um, a turning point. Now I want to write more and more and share more. So I think um, writing really helped me and to talk about my trauma experiences and everything. Please do write more and share with us. And Natasha Ramundu is actually with us amongst the attendees. Yeah. Hi, Natasha. Um, speaking of um, strong girls, strong women, strong mothers, um, the mother figure is very important in your story. Um, how do you see, Marwa, the role of the women and mothers of Kabul? I feel like loads, I mean, majority of the women in Kabul stay home, they're housewives and look after the kids. I think they have... Um, a significant role. Um, I think mother roles performed that shape the life of a child to become a, con a contributing member of the society. And I think mothers will always make um, a difference in our life. They teach us everything, how to walk, how to pray, how to learn beliefs, values, think, I think everything. And I think they're a priceless gifts. If you have a mother, um, I think who always pray for you, um, you are truly blessed. And also, mothers teach us the power of words and the words that means, uh, I think the words that mothers speak have a powerful meaning and powerful words can build up a child. So um, 
I think my mother was a biggest supporter in my life. And, and I think if not because of her, I wouldn't be here. I remember when I applied for UNICEF, um, when I was doing the interview, it was a very long interview. And my mother was at the corner of the room uh, praying for me and telling me you can do it. And I think be I think it's because of her, I'm doing a lot of things at the same time. And I think they have a great role in the, their child life and contribute a lot. Thank you, Marco. Thank you very much to, to Marwa for, for that lovely reading and, and to Rehan and to both of you for sharing your time and work so, so generously with us um, this evening. We've just a few minutes for any questions um, from the audience. Uh, if anyone would like to put something in the chat or possibly enable you to speak. I'm not certain about that. I need to check with Stephanie, but for sure, any any questions in the chat um, for Rehan and Marwa, please do post them. Um, I'm just going to read a comment by Jennifer Redmond. Uh, thank you, Jennifer. She says, this has been an amazing event. Thank you to both speakers and hosts for putting on this event. I appreciate it so much. Thank you for all attendees for being here uh, with us on this um, special day. Um, I think we shouldn't um, let any that people stay too long, but I'll just read one more comment um, from Shazia Kamran. Both of you, Rehan and Marwa, you're very inspirational, uh, truly humbled and honored to have heard your story, like we both are here, Andrew and I. Um, so um, I'm sure um, People would have uh, comments, but I am going to have to, to close the event and to thank you all, Rehan and, I, and Marwa. Um, it has been a privilege to listen to you and see your creative work on all fronts. Uh, and we hope to see more and more of that. We are all in awe of your excellence and your positivity. Uh, thank you all for being part of World Refugee Day 2022 and have a good evening. Thank you.